Welcome everybody to another edition of the Morning Fuel. As, as, uh, as we've set, set out at the Petroleum Alliance to try to provide these online sessions to talk about some critical business and provide critical uh, business information. Uh, especially this is real timely uh, today dealing with uh, COVID-19 and unpacking some of the things that we're gonna have to, uh, uh, all of us are gonna have to comply with and or smartly comply with, I should say. Uh, as usual, your your, li your lines will be muted uh, and use the chat function to uh, 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 ask questions. There's gonna be a lot of questions today, but we're fortunate to have an expert uh, in the field, Chelsea Smith from Hall Estill here in Oklahoma City. Uh, she's a, a, an expert employee law and, and has really done a lot of work on the COVID-19 and how to deal with it, only, not only from the uh, employee standpoint, but from the employer standpoint. And I think that some of those questions had not been answered. And I think a lot of them will get answered today. Uh, Chelsea's also a Western Oklahoma girl and she is a, she actually has oil and gas operations of her own. So she's one of us and we're proud to have her. Uh, I'd like to introduce her now. And Chelsea, say, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Um, as David explained, I am an employment lawyer for Hall Estill. I advise businesses about employment laws. I'm also general counsel for the Oklahoma House of Representatives, where I advise members on ethics issues and then the institution on employment issues. And I also serve as contract general counsel for um, some smaller groups in the state. This past year, I think has probably been the craziest year I've experienced as a lawyer. Um, the workplace is forever changed. We now conduct meetings, you know, through Teams and Zoom and more um, remote platforms. We have more remote workers than we've ever had before. And more importantly, it's fluid. There are new laws. You know, I, I feel like the last time I talked about um, these laws and issues was about a month and a half ago. And since then, we've had several changes. And so whatever we say today, inevitably in six months, we're gonna have a whole new set of laws and regulations to deal with. And so it's, it's constantly changing, especially with a new administration. You know, I expect that President Biden will have plenty of changes that he'll wanna do this year. Excellent. <laughs> So I, what I think, I think this is gonna, we're gonna try to make it pretty interactive. And there's a lot of, we all of us have a lot of questions and I'm gonna, gonna start feeding you questions either from the chat line or some that we have that we're, we're very interested in finding the answer out. I think from an employer standpoint, one of the first questions is, is, is kind of give us a little overview and guidance on how we should, how should we deal with, with our employees from a standpoint of, of, of the COVID and especially uh, talk to us a little bit about vaccines and what we should, what should we be telling our employees? Okay, well, two part question. The vaccines is a little easier to handle, um, certainly not by the legal standard, but I would encourage people to get the vaccine and not mandate it because if you mandate it, there are so many issues with, you know, federal employment laws and potentially you could have claims that someone has an adverse reaction to the vaccine, you know, you could have lawsuits in that area. And so I would encourage them, I would help facilitate it if possible, send them the link to sign up, explain them how it works, explain it to them how it works, um, give them paid time off to take it. And, you know, now if you go and sign up to get the vaccine and go to another county in this state, someone may be traveling a couple of hours to get a vaccine. And so, I would encourage you to even give them, you know, an afternoon or a day off if, if you're able. Um, as far as COVID, I, I mean, it's going to be a while before this is over. And so, you know, I know the masks are a hot topic, so are vaccines and everything else, but um, I would encourage people to keep wearing the mask because inevitably it's spreading and people are getting sick and then it, you're going to have a lesser workforce if you don't most likely. And so um, be flexible with your employees, have open conversations. If they're having to take off a lot, you know, for childcare and things like that, you know, if you have a remote work option, that's always helpful. And, you know, I know there's abuses too with this. Um, hopefully not a lot of it, but I'm, I'm sure there are some. And so there should be accountability set up too for employees. 
So one of the things we talked about earlier was, is uh, this is all fall, all following under the guidance of the EEOC, EEOC, and you can tell everybody that's the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So that, uh, we're going to do that over and over because I had to look up a lot. I knew that one, but I did not know that, uh, for example, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has been deemed a direct threat. So it falls under the Americans uh, with Disabilities Act. So, so we, telling people to do things, uh, that, that, that particular act also protects people uh, from discrimination from a lot of different things that, uh, so mandating anything like, like the vaccine, I think most of our constituents are, are just trying to provide a helpful environment. I think that's good advice. Uh, we've we've done some things here at our companies uh, uh, to try to facilitate. One of the things that, that probably a lot of people are asking about is a, a lot of us are smaller companies, and you know when you lose two or three people out of your staff due to not maybe it's not maybe it's a contact tracing issue with a child in school and they're at home. And so what, one of the things we did was is we kind of made during this time a special. Uh, kind of a bonus for however many kids for additional like time time to be at a daycare or things like that. So being real flexible with your employees. And I think Chelsea echoed that when I talked to her. So one of the things that uh, I was a little bit uh, taken back by was is that, that this is a, uh, you know, that the most of the most of the things that were set in place with the fa the, the family first uh, coronavirus relief act kind of expired can you tell us that they all expire at the end of the year or what what are we what are we up against now and we're just waiting for something new chelsea kind of tell us what you think okay so the families first act that was what we were operating under since march until december 31st 2020. And under that act, it allowed, um, it expanded Family Medical Leave Act, which is FEMLA, and they referred to it as eFEMLA. And then it also gave us the Sick Leave Act, which is where, um, you know, employee could get, I think it was two weeks of paid leave if they had, if they fell into the categories of having COVID or having a direct relative with COVID. But what's important about all of that is none of it matters now unless the employer wants to take advantage of the payroll tax credit, and then um, they can still use that for their employees if those employees didn't use all of their leave up in 2020. So if someone went ahead and took all of their time from the Sick Leave Act and took eFEMLA, then even if the employer takes advantage of the payroll tax credit, they, they're toast, they can't do anything. And if the employer chooses not to take advantage of a payroll tax credit, then same thing, there's there's no leave. So currently, and, and I anticipate Biden will have something, but right now we don't have anything. And so during this interim type, time period, unless you fall in that super narrow category, then there's not really anything for leave other than company provided leave that you already have. Would, would you advise us to continue conducting ourselves quite like those rules were still in place? Or would you say, you know, I, I don't wanna, I, I, I think it's everybody's gotta be a reasonable reasonable person type standard on, on, on some of this, but, but would your advice be that even, you know, just because you're not required to do something doesn't mean that you should not do it, you know? I, what, what would your advice be? I think that I would be flexible. Um, if you have someone who themselves or their child, you know, through contract tracing has, can't come to work, then, you know, first I would say, see if there's an option for them to still do their work, but, you know, not expose the rest of the workforce. So can they do remote work is, you know, are there any other options there? And if there's not, then be flexible with the leave. I mean, I don't think that we should be um, allowing people to abuse you know, the, the employers in this case, but at the same time, you know, it is tricky. The virus is rampant um, and we're all just navigating it. 
and I think uh, just kind of the guidelines and probably most of them are CDC derived, uh, the guidelines around PPE, what we would, what we should is just stay the same, keep modus operandi, or should we just do the best? Sometimes you don't have a choice, like if you were going out in public, but, but is that is that also, is there any relaxation of the standards since the expiration of the, uh, any requirements of the employers that are now gone that were in, uh, in effect through the end of the year? No, there's not. And um, on January 21st, uh, President Biden asked for guidance from OSHA. And so I anticipate at some point they will issue some guidance and regulations that maybe might help us, you know, have, have some more information. But at this point, I would say keep operating as you have and, um, you know, social distance, wear a mask. And, um, you know, if you think you've been in contact with the virus, then follow the CDC guidelines. One of the, one of the things is, that, you know, if you look at, and I geeked out a little bit and read, the, read some of the, the excerpts on the case law that you threw into your presentation. And, and one, of the, one of the things was it seemed like that it was, all, it was all people that were objecting to taking the vaccine due to some religious or some, some of them sounded fairly like they were had allergies or some, something sounded like they had a, one, one particular case, the guy had like two letters from doctors saying he, he, was, he had severe anxiety about taking the vaccine was part of his diagnosis. Of, so he did have a history of being allergic to almost everything. And so he was very, and it looked like to me, most of these cases were like, were determined like if you're, if it's like a hospital worker and they're deemed a critical job and that it would, it made sense that it would endanger other people or some, or, or under that standard that it looked like they usually air, they usually were in the favor of the employer being able to enforce them to take the vaccine. But in our case, we are critical. We, we are, most oil, oil and gas workers fall in phase three, which is then the critical. So do you, what kind of draw a comparison of, you know, frontline worker or, 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 you know, first responder type person versus our phase three oil and gas critical? Is there, should we be worried about that? Should we be, should we be real? I, you know, no one wants everybody. All employers that are that are on the call want to make sure that they're doing the right thing, but they certainly don't want to be sued, right? So, so kind of draw, a, kind of fill in the blanks there a little bit for me, Chelsea. I think an easy comparison is someone who works at a hospital has direct contact with patients every day. Um, you know, even that position versus someone that is in HR or IT at a hospital. You know, the person who's in direct contact with patients all day, every day, they're going to be considered, you know, that upper tier and of essential. And, you know, that would be an employee where you can mandate a vaccine. And um, when you take it steps away from that, you know, like a critical worker, for example, then, you know, it it's a harder argument to make to mandate a vaccine. I, I, I guess I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to probably do, not a great job articulating, what I'm, what I'm, is there any duties imposed differently because we were deemed a critical industry on, our, on us, on, on our constituents at the charge lines? Um, no, there aren't any legal duties or, um, and you know, I don't, there's no, the law, we're, we don't have anything that is COVID specific necessarily. And even the EEOC, you know, they're just guidelines. Um, I suggest that people follow them, but they're not mandatory. It's not a, you know, a, a federal law. And so the answer to that is really no, there's, there's not, and there's not gonna be legally, you know, as far as liability goes, there, there's nothing to look at to really show us the difference in those types of employees. But again, I think the bottom line is we want to encourage people because we want a safe workforce, you know, and we want everyone to be healthy. We want 
all, all of every employer wants their company to be running, you know, at full capacity or as close to that as possible. And so, and I think that I read yesterday, and who knows if this is true, but I read that Oklahoma for the number, we rank number eight or seven for people that are getting vaccinated. And so people are getting vaccinated here. Um, and hopefully our numbers will reflect that. So I'll, I'll jump in, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind. Um, Chelsea, great talking with you and getting your knowledge for our, our members. So you've said a few times that mandating um, vaccinations is not uh, recommended from a legal standpoint, but encouraging your employees to get vaccinated if they so choose is, is more of what you, you recommend. So as um, our member companies are creating those vaccine policies, their internal vaccine policies, do you have any high level uh, advice that you could give them on what that policy, I, you've kind of touched on it, but I, I just wanna do kind of a big picture on what that policy could look like. So um, I would give them time off, paid time off, and especially since, you know, if you qualify for the vaccine now, it doesn't mean you can get the vaccine that day. You might not even can get it for two weeks. You have to, um, you know, go to the website, the state website, and put in your information, and then you get an email and um, basically click on a link, and then it has all of the spots that are administering the vaccine with availability. And, um, you know, I'm told that it can be you know, a long time before there's an availability. And if you don't catch it at right the first moment, you may not get it. And so I would just be super flexible in providing them time to go and get that if they actually qualify for it and, you know, have gotten to sign up for the vaccine. So give them paid time off. You could give them, you know, paid time off for just a few hours, or you could do half a day or a full day, you know, depending on what the employer is comfortable with. And I would highly encourage them to do that. The vaccine's free. So I don't think there's, you know, any reason necessarily to pay for it. And there's also some issues, you know, if someone wanted to give a, an incentive, you know, or something like that to an employee, if you've got an employee who, you know, doesn't take it because of, you know, in a religious affiliation or because of a disability, then you're going to still have to allow them to get that incentive some way or you could have some kind of legal claim. So, you know, I think incentives are difficult, but really if I would do paid time off, you know, a few hours up to a full day and um, just be helpful in giving them information on how they can get the vaccine. That, that's, that's the question around if, let's say that, you know, you're, you're strongly encouraging people to get vaccines in the phase that they belong in and, and getting this, the second, doing, going through the full protocol and let's say that we have somebody that uh, decides they just don't want to do it, okay, that for what whatever reason. So we went to the point of strongly encouraging that we're not mandated. And what would happen if for some reason that person ended up getting COVID and gave it to another employee? What, what would be our, is there any liability that could be, you know, should we put in writing strong encouragement to in emails and what have you and say, look, we really would like people to adhere to the rules. And here's, here's what we think. We think everybody should be vaccinated. We're all phase three. You should, you're eligible for other people are. So we would like for you to do that, not just for yourself and your family, but for your fellow work coworkers. Is that something that we should? Is that a, some, do you, like if I called, uh, and we probably need to, Give you a little commercial because this is what Chelsea does this for our legislative branch. They call her and ask her these questions, and most of us can't can't afford to have a you know an, an employment expert uh, G, GC uh, on our staff. So you can just pick up the phone and call Chelsea, and uh, she told me I could give her phone number out. So I, I am going to do that. I'm going to type it in on the chat, but but. Uh, just to call and say, hey, that's the, that's the type of questions I think people will ask is, what if another one of my employees gets sick because we we didn't mandate it? So what, what exposure, if any, would we have doing that? Um, 
I don't think you're going to have exposure for not mandating a vaccine um, at all. I think actually you would have more exposure if you mandated it. And then, um, you know, a side effect or something like that, or someone claimed they had a side effect and they could see you um, for several different things. And there could be some workers' comp liability. And so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's going to be a lot of liability for not mandating it. But I, I love the idea of sending an email, encouraging people, giving them information. And um, what you don't want to do, you don't want to, you know, walk up to an employee and say, why haven't you gotten the vaccine? And, you know, maybe their answer is they have a disability. And so then suddenly you've triggered the ADA and you have liability. So these are touchy, touchy, touchy subjects to navigate. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions. They are fact specific, you know, it, and you don't know your employees' health information typically. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Some people are open about it and, and some aren't. But you need to be really, really careful dealing with those type of issues because you can have some liability. We have some questions on the chat line that um, I think the big picture about these questions is, you know, it's not that you're here to um, say that we should, uh, you know, you're not promoting that the vaccine is the cure-all, but oh, no. that, yeah, we're, we're living in this world of this is our option. You know, we've all been stuck inside since March and there's this option. So employers want to navigate this vaccine situation carefully. Yes. But, but on that, I also had a question just about COVID in general. Have you seen um, lawsuits filed against employers regarding uh, someone getting COVID at, at work or anything like that yet in Oklahoma or federally? None in Oklahoma. Okay. There have been a few lawsuits. The last time I checked, um, probably December 2020. And um, there were a few, and it's mainly people getting fired and um, claiming that it was because they had to take off for COVID or, you know, something related to COVID when, you know, maybe also they have poor work performance. You know, you never know because all we see right now are, you know, the filing, and then you'll have the response by the employer. And so there, the court hasn't made a lot of decisions yet because this is also new, but I anticipate that there will be I, I think we'll have a lot of lawsuits. I do. I think that people are um, desperate also. You know, a lot of employers have had to reduce their force and, um, you know, some jobs have had to be cut. And I think that people are, you know, employment law is always a hot topic. I would say that, you know, if you look at even in Oklahoma, the filings, the federal court filings every day, there's almost always an employment lawsuit. And so, um, you know, I think that the fallout from COVID, I think we're going to have more of that. Okay. There's a pretty interesting question uh, in, that Robert Hefner posed, and I, I, I didn't even think of this, but, you know, due to the kind of the warp speed uh, uh, program and due to the, the did, did the manufacturers, were they granted any special exemptions from legal action if something went wrong? That I actually don't know. Um, I do know that the way the vaccine was formulated is totally different than any vaccine we've ever had before. Um, I read on the Oklahoma Vaccinate website the other day that it said that um, they still followed all of the FDA protocols, even though it's a, it was a quicker process. Um, so the short answer, I mean, I really don't know about, you know, liability for that. Um, but it is different, you know, rather than doing a, a live virus or, um, you know, using part of the actual virus, I think they, it changes, it's called it mRNA, and I am not a physician and know very little about these things, but I know that it, it basically gives your body using that mRNA protein a way to fight it off. And so there's a lot we don't know, just like with COVID, there's still a lot we don't know. I, the way I understand it is it creates it, it, it creates a um, a um, <clears throat> your your body to respond almost violently to with its own antibodies, and so it actually sort of introduce more susceptibility in order to build your immunity up quickly. I, I'm like a, like you. I'm not a physician, but I, it seemed like it was like you know, 
you're tricking your body into thinking, oh, that we're really under attack, not just sort of under attack. And, and so it accelerates. I think that's true. And I've heard people getting, you know, I had a friend who's a physician take the vaccine and they were violently ill the next day. Mm. You know, um, I don't hear of that ever happening with the flu vaccine or anything else. I think it used to happen a lot with the flu vaccine when it was a live virus. But, you know, that was years and years ago. But uh, right now, uh, there, there's, I was just checking the chat line. Uh, uh, what, pretty good question uh, from, from uh, to the panelists about uh, from Sherry Gons that uh, is it okay if we keep a some sort of Excel spreadsheet or tracking of who got vaccinated, who had who had leave for contact tracing, who you know for whatever reason, should we be tracking that or is that creating liability for ourselves? Um, you can, and you, the EEOC has said that you can even ask for proof of receipt of a COVID vaccine. Um, but again, I would just discourage you from asking any, you know, questions about why someone didn't receive it. So I think, you know, proof that they've received it, keeping track of it, that's all okay. That reminded me of something uh, that I read that, uh, just kind of falls under, the vaccine falls under the definition of a medical exam with the ADA. And so you can't ask people about, well, what's your doctor say? You can't really ask that question because it's about oh, like rights. So you can't really say, how'd your vaccine go? Did you, I, I, I don't know how you would, um, I, I know that's all kind of silly, but, but it's serious. Uh, if somebody would be offended by the, you asking if they were, about how the vaccine went. Well, I think um, it's in in practice, it isn't maybe that hard. You know, if you send out an email and say that, you know, you're allowing employees to have X amount of time to go and get the vaccine, you're going to know when someone gets it because they're going to have to tell HR that they're going to take off to get it. And you just say, hey, you know, please submit proof to me. That way, you know, we can keep track that you went and got your vaccine. So that allows you to, um, that's where you put in your spreadsheet and, and you know kind of who's gotten it. And then you don't have to worry about asking people. I, I, would, just, I would just remind everybody that, that through, our, through our partnerships and our sponsorships with our, with our vendors, and they're all members of the Detroit Alliance as well, they, there's a ton of services that for example, putting Chelsea's number up there, I, I think that's a, a bargain deal if you can get some help. If you have a question, putting her number up there. Uh, Lane Grimes over at um, Amshot, you know, setting up people remote. If you don't know how to do it, there's a, there's a lot of resources. We can point you in the right way if you call, uh, and we would do that immediately to help help folks if they're, especially if there's some people out that you really maybe they've had a contact and they're they're out with their kids or something and maybe they're not really sick but they're stuck at home maybe we can uh, steer them towards some resources here yeah and we had a, a couple of other good questions pop up and i think um this one um asking did you say that covid now falls under the ada guidelines chelsea no so we have EEOC guidelines, and I'm hopeful we'll have some OSHA guidelines, but we don't have those yet. But the ADA could be triggered by COVID. And so if you're differentiating between employees. So the, the ADA hasn't actually, um, there's nothing in the ADA that addresses COVID or the vaccine for that matter. But when talking about the vaccine and, um, you know, how that would work and if you want to make it mandatory or not, that's when you can have the ADA come into play. And also that's when Title VII, which is the um, Civil Rights Act of 1964, but, you know, that's where, that's what people sue under. So if you have, you know, someone with a disability or a sincerely held um, religious belief, and if they're claiming that you know, they have either of those things that prevents them from getting the vaccine and you mandate a vaccine, 
that's going to trigger the ADA and they can file a lawsuit against you. It would also trigger the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you know, if it's a religious claim. And so that's that's why those two federal laws are important and that's how they come into play. It, it's not, it's not, it's not, that's why I was the, in the, the ADA, uh, there's some sort of general uh, um, a description of placing vaccines under as a medical examination. Doesn't that mean that it's going to be triggered by, if you mandated somebody to get a vaccine, doesn't that trigger it? The it, ADA could. Thing? it? It could. Huh. That's right. Just like this, the cases that are out there, you know, there's one about, there's a, a tetanus vaccine. I think one about rubella. There's one about the flu vaccine. And so that's why those were important. And they, they found that it is a medical examination. And um, also, you know, when, when you're going through that analysis, if it's also a medical examination, if you ask someone if they've had the vaccine, or if you ask someone if they've had a vaccine, they have a disability that triggers it. Did I get that point? I know it's. Yeah. Well, and I think we have we have a really good question, probably a little bit related to HIPAA. Well, yeah, related to HIPAA, but can you tell employees that someone in the office has COVID? Um, number one, um, or is are that is that person protected by HIPAA? So, um, what I've seen a lot of, it, and no, you shouldn't tell people that someone has COVID, but if they've been exposed. You know, and the CDC has recently changed it. It's, you know, at first we thought that if you were in the same office environment and, you know, sharing a copy machine that you might have had exposure. Now I think it is more than 15 minutes and you have to be closer than, you know, six feet apart. And so if you have an employee that's been exposed, then yes, that, that employee has a right to know and they should know. Um, but you should not be sending out a, company-wide email that says, you know, Jim has COVID and, you know, he was in the office yesterday. What I would advise doing is, you know, say that we have a positive COVID case. And if you have not been contacted, you do not have direct exposure to this. And then you contact those who have had direct exposure and tell them. And sometimes the employee who has COVID doesn't care. Sometimes they're like, yeah, tell everybody I've had it. You know, I don't care. Right. I think that's really good advice. These are a lot of lot of good questions. I was hoping that this would be how it went because there's a lot of people concerned about legal exposure and doing the right thing for their people more than anything. So uh, do you have, uh, Adrian, do you have uh, any other questions for Chelsea? We're kind of run past our time a little bit, but uh, as usual, <laughs> we run past our time. Well, I, I don't think I have any questions. I know um, you did mention that you are, uh, sorry about that. Uh, you had a presentation that you don't mind us sending out to our, our members. So that'll be really helpful. Um, and then um, Mr. Chairman, do you wanna go through the upcoming events and that kind of thing with the group? I don't know if I have the full list. I, I do know that we have uh, uh, A.G. Hunter next week. Yes. yes. But I, I didn't, I think we have a, a uh, morning fuel with the big co insurance company who, who has been a partner with us for many, many years and worked with, alongside us. Uh, and then uh, it looks like we're going to talk about McGirt on February 24th, or at least the overall uh, contract modifications that are going on in Indian country, uh, which is another timely topic for all of us. So uh, we're just going to keep firing these things that we think are right on the front burner for everybody to know. I, I certainly appreciate uh, Chelsea being on our show and also that uh, Hall Eskel uh, uh, allowing her this time with us. We certainly appreciate it. And, and I, think, I think she would be, you know, uh, a great resource uh, to call and we shared her phone number uh, with the world here. So or at, least the, at least our world. So yes. We appreciate everybody being on uh, and we will see you do next you, week. Sorry, do you mind if I do a little bit of housekeeping before people log you off? Go, you go right ahead. Okay, a few things. Um, 
So uh, Natalie and Lauren and Annie have worked really, really hard to set our 2021 events calendar. So we'd love for you guys to go check that out and get those dates on your calendars. So uh, you'll find all that at our website, the Petroleum Alliance, Alliance.com. Um, but also those emails that come out every Friday, the highlights, make sure you're just clicking through those and seeing what we have going on because we're trying to get back to some in-person events as much as possible through this COVID era. And then yes, next Wednesday, we'll have Attorney General Mike Hunter, which will be a really great update because things have changed so quickly um, recently on, on um, McGirt v. Oklahoma and Seminole Nation double taxation issues. So we're really excited to have him on. So we hope everyone will join us for that as well. Outstanding. Thank you Thanks. so much, Chelsea. Thanks, everyone.